Thank you. Did a beautiful job, didn't they? Just awesome. In fact, I noticed all the songs that we sang and the song that the choir sang, and that song really are so meaningful, so powerful, and they, I think, help shine a little light on the emphasis of our Scripture today. So I want to thank everybody for their hard work, their preparation, and the presentation of truth through song today. Wow, I see you're here this morning. If I'd known you were behind me, I would have gotten happy. But I'm getting happy now as I look out and and I see you today, and I'm so glad that you are here. It's a great day to be a Christian. A tough day, but a great day to be a Christian. And I, I don't say it condescendingly or proudly, but the world needs us. They need what we have discovered. In fact, Jesus certainly knew that. He told us that you are the light of the world. And I dread to think of a world without the kind of light that you and I can bring to it. Well, um, it is 1113, young man, my buddy on the front row. It's 1113 right now. He asked me a few moments ago what time it was, and I didn't have a watch. So it's, it's 11.13, and uh, my message won't be long today. It will just seem to be, but it actually won't be very long at all. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, please, as we embark upon this venture together, as we continue our series through the book of James. We had a minor interruption there. I think they call it Christmas, but we're over that now, not over it, but it's past, and we are in James chapter 5, I think this message and one more coming from the book of James. Chapter 5, verse 7, be patient then, brothers. Sisters are included, generic term, and it's a term James likes to use. He uses it a lot. Let me just say this parenthetically, and I've been waiting all week just to say that word. But let me just point out how James loves that word. Chapter 1, verse 2, my brothers. Chapter 9, the brother. Uh, Verse 19 of chapter 1, my dear brothers. Chapter 2, verse 1, my brothers. Chapter 2, verse 5, listen my dear brothers. Verse 14, my brothers. Now, in verse 20, he did throw in, you foolish man. I found one for me. And in chapter 3, verse 1, my brothers. And, and all through the book, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, he keeps going back to this term of endearment expressing the heartfelt love and compassion he has for his fellow sojourners. He's reminding them we're all in this together. And let's be reminded of that today, that you and I, we're all in this together. James chapter 5, verse 7, be patient then, brothers. That's not the only term that we see repeated. And you'll note a repeated phrase or two in this brief text. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Verse 9, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Now, keep in mind who James is. 
James was the half-brother of Jesus. He was Jesus' eldest brother. And can you imagine what that was like? Having a brother who always had the right answers, having a brother who never earned a spanking, a brother who never had a sick day, a brother who always won at checkers. And I was thinking this morning as I was getting prepared, a brother who never missed a belt loop, a brother who always caught the biggest fish, the perfect kid, your brother. And yet, James and his brothers did not always believe that Jesus was the Messiah. John, in his gospel, tells us that even his own brothers did not believe in him. And Mark also notes, he tells us that members of his family said, excuse him, he's, you know, he's not right up here. He's out of his mind. But now, James calls himself in the very first verse of this letter, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened? A lot of things happened. Miracles everywhere he went, teaching like none had ever heard before. A resurrection, post-resurrection appearances, including to James, his ascension into heaven and the subsequent outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So here James is, now he's a leader. He is a pillar of the church, a pastor or bishop of the church in Jerusalem. And James will be martyred for his faith. He will be stoned to death around 62 A.D. So James has earned our attention and our admiration. The way I look at it, James is looking out for us. He's got our back. He comes along beside us. He puts his arms around us. He mentors, teaches, guides, comforts, coaches, and challenges us on how to negotiate through the minefield of dark and difficult days. First of all, James gives us exhortations. Exhortations. Put that word up on the signboard there. Thank you, sir. There is a repeated theme here, and I hope that we picked up on it. Anytime words are repeated in the Scripture, they must be important. They must be given our most attentive focus. There's a grouping of words here that are so closely associated, they could be considered as, as one. Words like patient. He uses that word four times. Stand firm. Patience. Perseverance, which he uses two times. So take note, in five verses, we have seven admonitions to be people who persevere. Let's look at a couple of those words. That first word, patience. When James uses the word patience, it's not a patience with people that he's talking about, although God knows we need that. Could I get an amen? No, this is a patient endurance in life circumstances. It's keeping on, keeping on, when keeping on is hard to do. It's really just another word for persevering. Now, what a word for the believer today. In fact, I suggest it is it is the word for believers today. He says in verse 7, be patient, then brothers. In verse 8, you too, be patient and stand firm. Verse 10, brothers, be an example of patience in the face of suffering. So we have this word patience, and another exhortation James gives us is found in that word perseverance. Note verse 11, You'll find that word twice in verse 11. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance. 
and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. I want to suggest that these words are amazingly, amazingly relevant for you and me today. That we will be wise to call upon the wisdom of James' words as we navigate through a society that is becoming increasingly hostile to Christian beliefs and Christians themselves. Now, whenever we study the Scripture, we need to look for several things, but one thing certainly is the, the uh, literary context, what precedes and what follows these words or phrases or verses. But also we need to look, uh, consider the historical setting or context the times and the circumstances that contextualized the people who first read these words. And James is writing to believers who are going through it, believers who have literally been physically, geographically scattered because of an intense persecution that has besieged the church. And they needed this message of perseverance. And James Waste no time in getting to that emphasis in chapter 1 and verse 3, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Verse 4, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Chapter 1 and verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So in the first outpouring of his pen, James addresses the elephant in the room. He addresses what they are going through, their trials, their tests. This letter is addressed to the 12 tribes, 12 tribes, so that's Jewish terminology, so we know the first audience were Jews, but they were also Christians, and they had been scattered, scattered, James says in that first verse, among the nations. They had literally run for their lives. That goes back to the book of Acts where Luke tells us that Stephen had been martyred, and Saul had gone from house to house, dragging off men and women and putting them into prison. How would you like living in that environment knowing there was a madman on the loose, authorized by the government itself, going from house to house, and your house could be next? It's a lot worse than a salesman calling. Because of the great persecution, this young church had scattered for their lives. It was a day of great and grave danger. James begins the epistle talking of their trials of many kinds and the testing of your faith. And in our text, he speaks of their need for patience in verse 10, in the face of suffering. Now, we suffer very little for our faith, and I don't say that to shame us, but to remind us that it wasn't always the case. And it's not the case, even now, in many parts of our world. And how long we continue to get off easy, no one can say, but, but already, already it's becoming discomforting to be a person of faith. I'm not a prophet, and by the way, neither are many who claim to be one, but, but that's another sermon. But don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if our society becomes much more aggressive in attacking our Christian faith. In fact, be prepared for it. Expect it. And they may come at you in ways you did not imagine, like they already have political correctness and pseudoscience and a supposed intellectual superiority, which often turns out not to be intellectual or superior. We're already there, and don't expect it to get better or easier or more comfortable. Paul warns us through a young preacher, Timothy, that in the last days, 
There will be men of depraved minds who oppose the truth. They call the truth a lie, and they call lies truth. That evil men will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So today, uh, another young preacher stands in front of you, me, and he passes on that warning. I am young, really, compared to Methuselah, some of those other guys way back there in the Old Testament. So James' words of patience and perseverance, I find them striking relevant, strikingly relevant, as relevant as they were when they were written. And they intersect right where life is being lived. I would like to someday in heaven look up James and say, thank you, my dear brother. Give him what he gave us. Thank you, my dear brother for reminding us, challenging us, encouraging us to be patient, wait, stand firm, persevere. And by God's grace and help, we're going to do that. Secondly, he also gives us examples. James gives us three examples that should spur us on I'm happy to tell you, first of all, he gives us an Iowa example. How many didn't, you didn't know Iowa was in the Bible? Well, it is. Look at verse 7. He says, be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. That's got Iowa written all over it, doesn't it? I've lived in Iowa for a good part of my life. I don't know much about farming. You want to know the truth? I don't know anything about farming. I really don't. I don't know the difference between a planter, a plow, or a picker, or if there is a difference. I have no idea. I just know that some of the most honest and hardworking people I've ever met are farmers. And I've seen enough to know farming ain't for sissies. I respect, admire, and appreciate those in the farmer's uniform, the bib overalls and the feed caps. There are many things to be learned from a farmer, but perhaps the most valuable lesson is his patience and perseverance. He works hard. He does his best to assure a good crop, but he knows there are some things, many things, in fact, that are beyond his control, that are in God's hands, the rain and the sun and the weather. And I can't imagine that an impatient man could ever be a happy farmer. The good farmer knows how to wait. It's part of his constitution. He must wait, and he must trust in God's Son and soil and seed and cycles, and he must persevere. James says, behold the farmer. But then he gives us another example, and that is in verse 10. He says, brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, of what did they speak, these prophets? Oh, they spoke of the coming Messiah, all of them. But they had to wait. They had to have the long view. They had to exercise great patience and perseverance. They suffered much, but they persevered. James gives us the third example, and that is in verse 11, and that's Job. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. So these examples, all three of them, they were tested, and they all persevered, and they were all rewarded. 
The farmer gets his valuable crop. The prophets get their Messiah. And Job, why James says, you saw what the Lord finally brought about there. Are you persevering? We persevere. We keep on keeping on because we know, put, to put it plainly and simply, we know that we are on the winning side. We cannot lose. James gives us exhortations, secondly, examples, and then thirdly, he gives us encouragements. Encouragements. James provides us with several incentives for serving the Lord here. I only have time for two of them. The first one is the Lord's coming. Look in verse 7. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. Verse 8, you too be patient, stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Now, another thing to look for when you read Scripture is tone, T-O-N-E. What is the tone? What do you pick up for that for tone, for, for the flavor of that text. I mean, how many know that tone makes a big difference? Sure it does. You're married, aren't you? If you're married, you know. I mean, there's a difference between get out of here and get out of here. I've heard both. I know there's a difference there. So I want to know, I need to know, when James says, be patient, stand firm, persevere, what's the tone? What is the tone in the words that he delivers? Is it a sad resignation to the inevitability of defeat? Is it a cry from the sinking Titanic? Is it akin to those testimonies I used to hear and I still haven't quite recovered from them? Oh, brother... Just pray that I'll hold on to the bitter end. Well, look at James' reminders here. You don't see defeat. You don't see resignation. You don't see a fatalistic viewpoint at all. You know what you see? You see hope. The Lord's coming in verse 7. The Lord's coming is near in verse 8. The ultimate triumph. I said triumph, not trump. Okay? This is our hope. We must never lose sight of our hope, and if we read our Bibles, we won't lose sight of our hope because the Bible is full of hope. Not only the Lord's coming, but the Lord's compassion. Adding to this, James says in verse 9, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Now, James is saying, I believe, that, look, don't grumble against one another because if you do grumble, there'll be, a, there'll be a reaction to your negativity, and that reaction will be equal or greater negativity. If you judge others, they're going to judge you. That's human nature. But the real judge, the judge that ultimately matters, is coming. In fact, he's standing at the door. And in verse 11, James thankfully adds the important footnote that he is full of compassion and mercy. So be like him and look forward to his coming with hope. When we who have put our faith in Christ meet him, the only surprise is going to be, I believe, what we hear here in verse 11 how full of compassion and mercy he is. And James is saying he's, he's right on the other side of that door. And when you go through that door, you will encounter his love, his mercy, and his compassion. So persevere. Persevere because there's character to be developed in you and me, and there's no shortcuts in getting it. Persevere because in 
Chapter 1, verse 4, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Persevere, my friend, because there's a legacy to be left behind. It's got your name on it. Persevere because every New Testament writer calls for it. Persevere because Jesus did. He persevered all the way to death on a cross. And we are told, let us run with perseverance the race set before us. Let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Persevere because you're heading somewhere. And when you get there, The compassionate and merciful judge is waiting for you. Persevere because in James chapter 1 verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. He stood the test. He will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. We just lost a prince of a fellow in our church. As has been announced, Jerry went home to be with the Lord. You know, when, when people die, we, we think of their accolades and their accomplishments, rightly so. Obituaries are used to tell their story, to highlight their interest, or to remind us of their, their character or their contributions or sometimes their, their quirkiness. When we read things like, He was a great athlete, whether he was or not, or he started and ran a successful business, or she never met a stranger. Her smile lit up the room. She was loved by everybody, or family was everything, or She loved her 14 dogs and 22 cats and eight goldfish and four guinea pigs. And sometimes there's a rather strange and unexpected information provided, like with Dolores Aguilar. She passed away August the 7th, 2008, and the obituary said Dolores had no hobbies made no contribution to society, and rarely shared a kind word or deed in her life. There will be no service, no prayers, and no closure for the family she spent a lifetime tearing apart. Wow, what a sad legacy. Louis Casimir, his obituary said, Lou was a daredevil. His last words were, Watch this. <laughs> Isabel Blow, the final line of her obituary reads, she is survived by Detmar Blow and a considerable hat collection. Marianne Nolan. Faced with the prospect of voting for either Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, Mary Ann Nolan of Richmond chose instead to pass into the eternal love of God on Sunday. (laughs) But maybe Douglas Legler had the right idea. His obituary had his picture, and underneath it, the words, Doug died. They all said he was a man of few words. Well, imagine trying to summarize a life in two words. Well, I think there would be two other words that I would prefer, and I would hope that they could put in my obituary, put these two words in my obituary on my tombstone. The two words, he persevered. 
He never quit. He never gave up. He never lost sight of the goal. He persevered because there was so much he didn't want to lose. And there was so much he had to gain. We look beyond death. We look beyond the grave. We look to the coming of the Lord when the perishable is raised imperishable. And when we see him, we shall be like him. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. Be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. That's what I'm talking about. Let's pray. Lord, this service has been infused with one reminder after another in song and sermon that we are people with a glorious anticipation, people with a promised ultimate triumph, and that hope is based on nothing else and nothing less than the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. That one who lived and died and rose from the dead, ascended into heaven and is now at the Father's right hand, and that one who will raise us up from the grave. That one who has given us eternal life. Lord, I thank you for that miracle of conversion and transformation in the moment. We are regenerated by the Holy Spirit, given new life, brought into the kingdom of God. Our names recorded in the Lamb's book of life. The Spirit sent to indwell us. Transformation takes place instantaneously, yet it must be lived out. And in the living out, we learn, we grow, we fail, we get up keep on keeping on and I thank you there's enough grace given from God himself to fill and flood the heart of every follower of Christ so that we cross that finish line as those who have persevered I thank you for the hope that has been bequeathed to your church down through the ages and still resides in the hearts of believers today it is a hope this world cannot give and this world cannot take from us it's an overriding hope an all triumphant hope a glorious hope a hope birthed in time that lives throughout eternity we owe it all to you Lord Jesus and we thank you for every good and perfect gift you give us along life's way. 